Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is a serial entrepreneur, global educator, and consultant. He is the co founder of Mind Valley Teach, Evercoach, and Global Grit Institute, as well as the author of The Book of Coaching and Live Big. Born in Jaipur, living in a home with 23 other people, he has always pursued the dream of living big. Over the past decade, he has helped build training and coaching companies to inspire the coming generation, transform entrepreneurs to live on purpose while enjoying their lives while increasing profits. He enjoys exploring the world, learning different cuisines, writing, and spending time with his wife, Nita. Welcome to the show, Ajit Nawalka. Thank you for inviting, man. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, man. I'm excited to have you on the show. We got introduced by a mutual friend, Mark Shapiro, who also has an incredible uh, podcast, Are You Being Real? So um, I, I enjoyed the, um, the connection and I looked at all the stuff you're doing. I'm like, oh my goodness, Like, where, where do we even start with this? Do we start with your book? Um, a little bit of the background on how uh, you got to where you are today. Um, I'll just let you kind of take it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And Mark is amazing for sure. So I start, let's start with knowing a little bit, just because your tribe may or may not know about me at all. So let me give you a sh really short little background of where I come from and where I'm going uh, and how, why it might be relevant for a lot of us listening to what we're going to talk about today. So I come from a household of about 23 people. I grew up in 23 people together in the same house in that small town that you talked about, Jaipur in India. And it wasn't that my parents had 23 kids. <laughs> that wasn't the case. It was uh, my parents, us, me, I mean, our family, then our cousins and my grandparents and their cousins and all of us lived in the same space. So as you can imagine, if 23 people try to share one place, one small house, how life would look like. Life was basically a lot of people in a really small amount of space for a really long time, basically all the time. Uh, and so I grew in a, in, a, in a reality where there was a lack of abundance and there was a lack of abundance of space, lack of abundance in terms of wealth, of course, uh, but a lot of really lovely people around you all the time, uh, which was okay until a time. But as I hit my teens, I realized that A, I really am an introvert. I really enjoy me time. And in the house of 23, you don't really get me time, right? Also, I realized that I was in that journey where I realized that I, I, I want to do something greater. I don't want to live and die in this house. I want to do something different. I want to be able to create the abundance that I want for myself and for my family, if possible, in the process, right? So at that point, my life goal became to be able to buy a house and move out of this 23-person house, but get a house and move my family and myself out of it. So buy a house for my parents. That became the dialogue that I really wanted to get and i wasn't hoping that i will be able to get there anytime soon i was hoping i'll get there by when i would be 40 or 50 or something uh and so i started to take the traditional route the traditional route in india is become an engineer doctor accountant and if you don't become any of them you're probably useless right and 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 so i took the traditional route i tried to become an engineer uh, i wasn't an a student i was i liked sciences a little bit but only for my curiosity it wasn't something that i wanted to pursue all the time so as i started to study for being an engineer, I realized it's not going to work. I just hate this. I would just like really hate it. Even if I became an engineer, I would be a really bad one. And so in that process, again, the big, big aha moment is like, I want abundance. This path's not going to work. What do you do? Now, my 17 year old self said the easiest thing to do right now is to just quit and try to figure out what it is that I want to do. Now, I'm grateful that my parents are really supportive. And so they supported that journey. They let me quit everything that I was doing at that time and say, okay, go figure life. But they also sent me with a footnote. The footnote was, <laughs> we can support you till you're educated. We have no way of supporting you beyond that. I don't have the money for it. I don't have the resources for it. I don't have the connections for it. So you got to figure out life in the next three, four, five years while you're still in college, right? And, and that led me to really start experimenting very aggressively with life. Like I started doing part-time jobs, multiple jobs at the same time, joined student organizations and so on and so forth. And it built my early character of trying things, not, not thinking about what is the worst that can happen, but thinking about more what's the best that would happen, 
right? And I, I started approaching life like that. And as I started to approach life like that, life also started giving me some really interesting people who would show me things that otherwise were only available for a price. And now at this stage, I couldn't really afford most of the things, right? So these people were kind, generous. They showed me different possibilities that are available in the world. They showed me how business is done. They, this was basically like free education that is available to all of us in the world. Like right this, like this conversations, conversations like these where I was listening more than talking, right? Because I was just like, okay, tell me more about this. And I'm just listening and I'm just taking it all in whatever I can and trying to make meaning out of it. And that was my early journey. And as I was taking all these different risks, I started to start, try to start some companies, they bombed. Uh, so I tried to do different things to really make it work, get investors, lost their money, you know, all the crazy stuff that we do. That's what I was doing for the early part of my career until I realized that there is tremendous amount of power in the internet. This was the time when Facebook was just starting out and we had started a social network in India, but at that time, Facebook was not in India. But as we built the whole network out, we saw this platform called Facebook. And it was so much superior that we were like, we're not gonna win this game. There is no way, we don't have a chance there. So we were like, even if we try to build out, so we kind of shut down that operation. But that, that idea at that time of, of using the internet stuck with me. I was like, this is the new media. Nobody knows how to do anything with it. Nobody has a clue, right? This is 10 years ago. But nobody has a clue on what is happening, especially in India. It was known here a little bit, but 10 years ago in India, they were like clueless. They were like, what is this internet thing, right? The, the adults didn't even know how to use internet, right? The kids knew. So like, this is the new thing. And if I play my cards right, this could be my, my way out. This could be my way out of that house, right? And so I started asking around. I started asking friends for help. I started asking friends if they knew any place where I could go learn. And there was this one person that I had employed some years ago. And I, when I reached out to him as well, he was like, hey, listen, you know what, it's not a proper job, but there's this company, it's a small startup with like 10 employees, they're working out of a bungalow and, and they are really cool company, they're fun. And same point or not, they are in the online space. So maybe you wanna, you wanna do an internship with them. I don't have a full-time job, there's an internship that's available. Like, you know what, I'm gonna try my hand on that. So I fly over to a different country, which is also motivated by the way, to get out of that house. You know, like even if I can please just not be there, that's all pretty great progress in my life. So I move out of that house. I, I go to Malaysia. That company was Mind Valley. At that time, Mind Valley was a ten-person small operation. Today, it's a movement of three hundred employees, millions of followers, hundreds of thousands of customers. But at that time, it was a small operation of ten, fifteen employees and a few thousand customers, right? A few hundred customers, for that matter. And and so I moved to Malaysia. I started working with this company over seven years. We built the company out, and I became the CEO of the company, right? It's so a great trajectory there, like really did everything, grinded it out and, and really built, uh, helped build the company and helped build my life as well, right? I bought that house that I was hoping I'll buy at 40. So I had all the bells and whistles and you know, the things that the world would say, would say, okay, this guy is successful, right? That, that dialogue was there already because I like as a young kid, like 30 something and, and already leading a company and organization like Mindvalley. It was the dream come true in a way only to realize that as I was building a living for me, I had lost all of my life. My health was in shambles, my relationships were not really there, I had no connection with my parents, I wasn't talking to my friends, I was being a bad leader. All of those things start to reflect back in my life and I was like, holy shit, what is happening here, <laughs> right? I should be happy right now, why is it that I am not feeling the joy? I should be feeling the joy, I can afford whatever I want to afford, right? And so that, took me on an intrinsic journey, journey within myself to really be able to ask questions which were more in tune with why do I do what do I do, right? Why is it that I show up in a particular way in context of as a leader? Why is it that I don't call some of my friends even if I love them? Why is it so hard for me to express that love and appreciation for other people and so forth? And as I started to explore those ideas, I found that it had a lot to do with with my inner dialogue and me not really identifying my values and knowing that I can actually have a big life. And by a big life, I mean a life of choice, a life where you get to decide what you want for all of the other stuff. And it's not based on what the world asks you to do, but it's more based on what you ask of the world or how you wanna create your world in a way. And that took me to a whole new dimension where we co-founded a few companies, 
I started to, I found my partner. I started to travel again for joy, not for work, for, for joy, for actually for the purpose of travel. I became very healthy, very fit, built a relationship back with my family, now started a family. All of that stuff happened in the last three years since I started to ask that question and started to reevaluate my life. Because what I didn't want, and that's one thing that was different, is that I didn't want, okay, I'll get, reclaim my life, but my business will go to shambles. That's not what I wanted. I didn't want to compromise on all the abundance I had always wanted, right? So I wanted to be wealthy and I wanted to have a balance in life and be able to have time for family and time for kids and time for all the other stuff that I wanted, right? So I had to find a very different playbook than what usually we tend to. Usually we tend to business ideas, right? Business idea, business strategies. And here's a secret that I found. As I was doing that journey for myself, I had no intention of writing a book at that time. I was just doing this because I needed it, right? But I, in one of the companies that we started called Global Green Institute, we started to coach and consult other companies and be able to help them grow their businesses. What we found is everything that I was trying for myself worked for these other companies too. So everything that seemed like a crazy idea and only applicable to myself, I found that if I implemented that those in these companies and with CEOs and founders of these companies, not only did they have a full life, their companies on an average grew by 30% to 200%. Right, so that's insane because all of a sudden you are like, holy shit. It's not about only go doing the inner work and finding the balance within yourself. It actually does translate to external reality. There's something that's happening here and that gave birth to Live Back, which is the book that we talked about today. Holy crap, okay man, well that, 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 that's, a, that's a full story. Um, one of the things I'll just kind of touch on is that one of the beginning things you said is that you were trying and failing. And I think that in the culture that we have in the Western world, a lot of people are just too afraid to try. But for mm -hmm. you, you kind of had this catalyst, like you, you know, just went for it. So try and fail, try and fail until you succeed. So I think that's a, an important yeah. thing to touch on. But I'd love for you to just keep going and share, um, you know, how did that discover, what did you start asking yourself um, and then go into the book because I've had a, the opportunity to look through some of the chapters and I th think they're really great. Um, one of the important ones, happy first, I think I'd love for you to touch on that because, you know, you kind of got one side where it's just like, I don't have enough money to pay the bills and I'm stressed out. I have a job that just pays enough. So I need to create more income. The other side is I know what makes me happy, but sometimes we we we're so stuck in, in making money or, or surviving, we don't have time to even look at that. So maybe you can kind of let me know what's best is kind of maybe go through a little bit of each chapter or what you think is most important to touch on. So let's, let's start with the context that, that you started. Okay. So firstly, failing, let's start with failing first. And, and because it's an important conversation for us to have. Right. Um, and, and I resonated more with, uh, do you know this philosopher called Alan Watts? Yeah, oh yeah. Heard about it? yeah, yeah, yeah. So Alan Watts is, is, is he's he's no more, but one of his lectures he talks about. He's a great philosopher. Everybody should check it out once in a while whenever you have time to really look into some philosophy that can be different than what we have been talked about or what we have been told often. It's 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 an interesting spin on life. Uh, one of the philosophies that he talks about is that he says something to the tune of that life is not a journey. Life is more like the music. And music, you don't wait for the end note of the music. You enjoy the music as is. And the music has high notes and low notes. And all the notes are to be played with and enjoyed because they bring the, the charm of music. That's why music is interesting because of different notes that are in the music, right? That's how failure and success is in life. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a comment. It's not a judgment. It's not the end of the story. It's a part of the story. And if it's a part of the music, it's a part of the story, it allows you to be able to say, hey, this is all good. Like if, me, if I fail, that's okay. If I win, that's okay too. I don't have to go crazy because I won and I don't have to go crazy if I lost. What I have to do is enjoy both of them because both of them are part of this beautiful music called life, right? So that's really the interesting spin on really rethinking about failure. And I, and I believe really we all human beings are so smart, so capable that if we have the right thought process, if we had the right perspective, that's sometimes all we need. Sometimes all that we need is the right perspective. And so I, I hope this perspective helps. Second part you were talking about was happy first. That's actually one of the chapters in the book. And happy first comes from a place of, because of the same dialogue that you mentioned. A lot of times what happens as entrepreneurs and as employees and professionals, what we think is whatever our current reality is, that's the reality that will stay. 
right? Because what we can see as human beings or we, what we can't see as human beings is the future, right? We don't know what's gonna happen in the future. What we can think about is the immediate future. We can think about tomorrow. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, but we can think about it. We can plan for it, right? We can plan for next three months, six months, maybe a year but we don't really know if it'll unfold the way we want it to unfold. So when somebody says, hey, I, I'm in a job that I don't really like, or I have a business that I don't really appreciate, but I, and I have this passion, I, this, is, this is what makes me happy, right? How do I go about doing it? And that's where the happy first chapter comes from, is my invitation to everybody who thinks about that and goes, well, I really enjoy this, but this kind of pays the bill, is to see how can you lean in to being happy first and then figure out how to make money out of it. And the reason and the logic behind it is not to say, hey, quit your job today and, and start doing things that make you happy. That's not a smart way to do things. Honestly, I, I do know that's an advice that's given often, but I'm actually counter to that. But I would invite you never to do that. Don't just quit your job because you wake up on the other side of the bed and you're like, I'm gonna quit everything. Or definitely not because you attended a seminar and now you wanna quit everything because the seminar leader said, live your passion, right? It's a great thing, and yes, you should think about now how you will live your passion, how you will be happy first, but don't just quit everything. Now, here is what, what really needs to happen as a conversation, as a dialogue for entrepreneurs and for professionals, is to start looking at what are the things that make you happy. It'll be some things that will be you're passionate about, some things will be around your life, some things will be around your lifestyle, some things will be around your relationship, but whatever that is, like spending time with your loved one, for example, or having a kid, whatever that is that makes you happy. If you start to start from a reality or start to intend to create a reality where you are happy first in the sense of being able to say, hey, how do I fill my tank? How do I fill my tank? How do I become content with everything that I'm getting? How do I find that joy? And, and the clear, clear science for it. It's not, it's not a complex thing. It's very clear science. That will know, you will know, oh, that's, that's, that what make, makes me happy. That's what gives me contentment. That's what gives me joy. Well, do that first. And it would, it would sometimes mean, well, I have to also do this job, which is fine. Do the job till the time it pays the bill because happiness will go away immediately the moment you don't, you're not able to pay your bills, right? So if you don't want that, but what you do want is to start leaning into the idea of saying, how can I stay in a place of happiness first? How can I play, stay in a place of content first and a place of joy first? And as I start to live more and more of it, what we will see is that you will start to create an alternate reality, a reality where you can be happy first and then go to your job. And you can be happy first and then invest time, extra time in your business so you can quit that job that is not aligned with your happiness or whatever that is that is not giving you the joy and happiness right now. but in eventuality, in the five-year or 10-year vision of yourself, you can get rid of it and create something that where you're always starting from a place of happiness and joy first, because that is where true productivity comes from. That is where true joy comes from. That's where you will actually be excited about what you're, you're creating in life and not really be bogged down or disappointed with what you're doing in life, because happiness is a great fuel, is a great place to be from and operate from, and it is available to everybody. It's for us to, us to really design around it. Yeah, man. Well, you touched on a lot of great points there, and I'll just kind of you know share my view. One of the things that I've been saying recently about the happiness thing is that we kind of get stuck in what task list, I call task list or fear-based consciousness, meaning we got to go get money so we can go get food and keep shelter over our head and we don't have time to think about anything else. So if that's operating at like 98% of your life, but then what you talked about leaning into happiness, you also, if you look at that part of it and you can even get it to 90 to 10% happiness, that's a huge shift for where you are. Then get to 80, 20, 70, 30. And what you'll find is that when you do that, you know, the, it, life isn't just about work and survival, although it can start there, like where you started with tw a house of 23 people. Yeah. It's got to start from somewhere, but you have a vision and a direction. And then you're taking action. That's another big thing that I think people need to recognize is that you're consistently taking action, getting feedback, taking that feedback, taking more action. And we can kind of get frozen in just what is the best thing to do? What is the one 
you know, way to do it and you just do it. And skateboarding is a great example because nobody gets on a skateboard and lands a kickflip first try. It takes like a few mm -hmm. hundred tries usually, which is ridiculous. Yeah. But you take action, you get feedback, you keep moving forward. Um, so if you can lean a little bit more, go from 98% to like 5% happiness, 10%. And that's going to give you energy to just shift the direction. You also shared that, you know, think about five to 10 years really, you know, we're thinking about six months next week, you know, give yourself a lifetime and that's a direction and all of life's going to happen in that way. But you, you're starting to redefine of what's, what's valuable, what's important. How do I move in that way? So I think that those are really brilliant uh, concepts. And that's I'll just beautiful. say, and I want to emphasize on something that you said is you got to start where you are. You can't start yeah. somewhere else. You can't like, it's just not possible. You are where you are. And what you think about is, hey, how do I get to a place where I live my ideal self, right? So it's so right. And you're so spot on and saying, well, you are where you are. Just start there. And there's some place. It could be 98.2% or it could be 10, 20%. doesn't matter. Whatever is the level that you're at or whatever, whatever is the stage that you're at, even better as a word, start there. And that's a great place to start. And you're at a great place to get started right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then all you're doing from whatever that state is and what you're sharing, like you got your first goal was to get to like that abundance, right? Then you got mm -hmm. there and then all of a sudden you realized it wasn't everything that you wanted. So then all you did was just take a look and go in and say, what is it that I want? That's all you yeah. did. And, and so that's, it changes your direction, but you need to take the time to do that. That's the important part. Absolutely. And as you start to move in that thing, like you said a lot of great stuff there, is the contentment piece. If you're able, not even be happy, just to be content with where you are, with, with who you are, with where you are, with where you're going, with what you have right now, and build in that direction that inspires you, you're really kicking ass at that point. You know, that's kind of what it's about is like, the, it has all the Zen philosophy too. you know, surrender. And you know, you don't get to, you might get it all and then lose it all. You don't know. But if you can remain with that powerful um, contentment with the powerful intention that you create, you're really, you know, pretty on point and pretty aligned. That's true. That's true. And content um, is, is hard to get because we are living in a society where everything, nothing is enough, right? Nothing yep. feels enough. Nothing is enough, especially with the amazing tool that social media is. It brings tremendous amount of discontent in human beings because of the constant social comparison. It's actually a proven theory uh, where we used to always socially compare ourselves versus somebody else, you know, uh, but now because of social media, you're constantly comparing. There is no end to it because the moment you log, you fire up your Facebook or you fire up your Instagram, you look at somebody else's life and then you almost immediately go, well, how about mine? Oh, they are in this wonderful place. What about me? Right? So that what about me, that constant comparison is beating us down so heavily in today's time that it is almost uh, impossible for us to find that contentment. Which is why my invitation for you is to really define where you are and really define where you want to go. And, and one great trick that I found to find contentment immediately is to, is to think about where you were five years ago, right? Because the moment you think about where you were five years ago is most likely 90% of us have made great progress in the past five years, right? From just the type of human being you were, it doesn't matter if you didn't change your job or so forth, just type of human being, the learnings that you've had, you probably made great progress from five years ago to now. And the moment you see that, you get immediately grateful about it. You immediately feel, oh, wow, I made such great strides. Because five years is a good time for us to make great strides, right? So you go, okay, I made great strides, I made great progress. I can find that gratitude in today. I can find that contentment in the day. Now let's think about where I want to go in the next five years. What's my chase? Not in competition with anybody, but a chase for myself, for a better version of me, for a greater version of me, for a more honest version of me. Yeah, man. Again, you're really on point with all that. I think it, you know, what you're sharing is just creating the life that you decide. And that's what we all have the opportunity to do. But it does require our own thinking and our own design, right? You're, you're designing whatever it is. For me, when I left college, it was to snowboard every day. And it took a while and it took some feedback, took some things. But eventually, I got to the point where I snowboarded every day for myself and I did it for seven years and it was friggin' amazing. Then there got to a point where I wanted to change that. And so I had to go back in and figure out where I wanted to go. And it's your own vision. It's not anyone else's. You get to design that and you have the power to create it. Um, but you first need to de design that 
vision and take that step back, define what's important to you. So, you know, those are all really amazing points. What I wanted to ask you, because I, I've, again, I look through the chapters of your book and there's so much uh, depth here and it's really on point. Um, is there any, do you want to um, cover any of the chapters in particular um, or do you want to, uh, you know, do anything else? Cause it, what I was interested about, you know, the first three contexts is meaning mojo and magic, which I really like all those things. Yeah. Um, but you also have an extensive entrepreneurial background and there's a ton of entrepreneurs out there. And for them, usually it's about how do I, build up the business to get the money, to get the cars. Right. And so mm -hmm. can you offer some advice? So like, here's some solid business advice, but here's mm -hmm. also a way to do that. Um, in, in like a little bit of a different perspective, like for sport, mm -hmm. the way that I share it is like, look, let's be the best athlete and, and be, you know, number one, but you got to do it from a state of fulfillment from where you are appreciating the process. So even if you mm -hmm. become number two or you fail, it's not a big deal because you're solid. Right. Mm -hmm. You're you're creating, you know, the best that, you know, you can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and again, it's it's not we don't need to compare to be able to go if you're second, third or fourth or fifth. You just see where you want to go. And if you meet that, you usually it's it's like the and you're, you, you you talked about athletics. And I know this is a, I, I'm not an athlete, but this is a theory that I've heard uh, is that runners or sprinters that win never look behind to see who is behind them. They just chase, they just look at their goal and they run as fast as they possibly can to it. That's you chasing your goals, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you tend to win just because you're chasing your goal. You're not chasing somebody. You're not looking at who's faster or slower than you. You're just looking at yourself and, and chasing it. Now, here's one thing that I would like to invite entrepreneurs specifically to who are listening to this conversation to, to think about a little bit more. So when I say that on an average, we are able to grow companies anywhere between 30 to 200%. It's not something where we go, all right, so let's work harder, right? Which is the obvious answer that everybody gives, right? It's like, okay, and I see this on social media every day. All the geniuses are saying, let's work hard, right? Honestly, no really successful entrepreneur works really hard. They work. I'm not saying they don't work, right? And they work hard in context of, do they do high quality work? Yes. But they, it's not about the number of hours they put into the work that makes them successful. It's about the work that they're actually doing in that ecosystem that makes them successful, right? And, and what does that mean? You see, most entrepreneurial success is dependent on the product, the process, or the people. The product, the process, or the people, right? And that influences a lot of other things, and that's where people tend to go, okay, so what about marketing, or what about messaging, and so forth? It's all a part of the process. So it all goes within these three dimensions to be able to define it. So let me go a little bit deeper into this. So what happens most of the time is people stop with marketing. They think about how do I sell something, right? But the thing about a great marketing piece is it always is created for a great product first, right? Apple's marketing is solid because their product is solid. Mind Valley's marketing is solid because the product is solid. It's not about the marketing. It's very easy to write marketing for something that's actually great, right? It's really hard to write marketing for something that's actually not good, right? Because you have to come up with things. In marketing where the product is good, what you can do is you can literally just tell about the product, tell the story of the product, tell the product, tell about what the product is gonna do, great marketing, already done. You don't have to do anything, right? So it starts with the product, but most entrepreneurs forget that. They start with the product and then they forget about their product. They get focused on marketing, they get focused on how do I get more reach, more people, this blah, blah, blah. And that sounds really good as ideas, but they're not. Focus on your product. You make your product better, people will automatically get attracted to it. I'm not saying that it will be automatic marketing. You'll still make some effort towards it, but it doesn't have to be that much effort. You don't have to be a copywriting genius to write great copy for a great product. A great product automatically writes great copy for you. And yes, you need to know the tools and strategies and so forth, but you don't have to be a genius at it, right? And you'll be able to create a great product and marketing for itself. Second was people, which is again, one of the big things that entrepreneurs miss. Entrepreneurs tend to go, okay, so I don't want to work with people. I hate people. That's what I did in uh, different organizations. This is what I did in corporations. I don't want to work with people, right? But that's the reason why you don't like to work with people. The reason why you hate people or you as an entrepreneur don't want to build a team is not because you don't want to interact with people. We all are human beings. We want to interact with people. What we don't want to do is interact with people that we don't align with. And there's a big distinction in that that we don't understand. Yes, you don't want to get a team because your, your understanding of a team is a bunch of skill sets. Of course you hate it, 
because it's a bunch of skill sets. There is no essence to it. There is no value to it. There's no juice. Who do we connect with as friends? Not because of their skill sets. You don't find a friend because their skill sets great. Right? You find a friend because you love the person. You love their value system. You love what they stand for, what they stand against, and there's an alignment there. That's how you build people. That's how you bring people on your team. That's how you bring people as one community. You find value aligned team members that want to work for a common vision that you and they have set together, or at least in alignment with each other, right? And then you give a damn about them in the process of it, right? That's how you build a team. And then you will love to build a team. You won't hate it at all. You will be like, I want a bigger team. I want to have more people working with me because guess what? The more people, like they just, I get to spread all this love and I get to share all this love. We won't hate the team then. We won't hate people then, right? So first thing, very important, think about your product way more than what you think about your marketing. Your marketing will resolve itself. Second, think about people, not because you need a bunch of skill sets, but think about people as a set of values that you want in your company and by your side as you build your enterprise. And lastly is process. Another hated term in business, right? It's like, oh, I don't want to follow a process, right? Here's the thing, all of us love processes. And I'll tell you why. You love the way your food is laid out, don't you? Right? You love a particular set of dishes made in a particular way. You love how you brush your teeth, right? Because else you would have changed it, right? You don't change it because you just love that way of doing it. There's a set way of doing it. That's a process. The reason why you hate processes is because you didn't build them. You hated processes in your last company because HR built it for you right? Or whatever somebody else built it for you, right? So as a professional as well, that's why you hate the process. Somebody else built it. You don't find alignment with it. And so you're like, I don't like processes. That's not true. You love processes. As a human being, you love certainty of a process because a process is nothing but a set of activities that creates a certain result. That's it. That's a process. Everybody loves certainty in certain areas of their life, right? Not in all areas of their life, but certain areas of your life, right? So you got to think about process as just that. It's just a set of activities that creates a certain result. How can you build processes that allows you to be able to get that certain result, right? And that will give you the pace that you need in a company. Because again, this is what happens with entrepreneurs. We go every day, we open our laptops and we start to react to the world. Emails, social media messages. Oh, that person said do this webinar. Oh, that person says write this in their sales letter. Oh, that person said that's the new uh, shiny object and let me just chase that. That's you living from a place of reaction. How about we live from a place of proactivity and creativity? How about we switch that dialogue and say, here is where I want to get to, and here are the set of activities that I do that will get me this result. Let's build a process around it. Let me hire some of the best people that I love to hang out with to help me run this process while I create the greatest delivery for my clients through my product. Right? That's the secret to business growth. As simple as this is, this takes us months to really, months and months to really build it into companies. But if I had to really boil it down, it's one of these things is where the failure point is. Or one of these things is where the growth is limited. Is where they're like, okay, they didn't think about the team or they didn't think about the process or they didn't, didn't think about the product and hence not the marketing because they didn't just think it in the sequence that they should be thinking. And, and the moment we eradicate even one of them, even one of them, all they have to do is optimize one of them and you see immediate growth in the company. So if there's something that you're looking for right now is growth in the company, look at three, three of these dimensions and you will find a way to grow your company right now. That's all really sound advice. It's nice and practical. It's, it seems to logically make sense. Um, and I think that, you know, if you look at any of those three things, it's, yeah, I agree. It's going to be one of them. Um, and I think that it's, it, it basically works, but my mind is going in a different thought here. That's why I'm kind of like struggling with my words. I just came back from the Parliament of World Religions um, mm. in Toronto. It's a big thing. And so I had a specific question with it's kind of like a right turn. Um, mm. Then I went to Disclosure Fest in Washington. So one of them was mm. about personal development and the existence of extraterrestrial life. The other one was mm. looking at planetary spiritual leaders. And mm -hmm. so when I looked at it, there's over 200 distinct faiths. And in doing personal development, self-help, entrepreneurship, business, being Canadian um, and listening to my friends talk about they have a home and they're struggling to like make ends meet, right? Pay, put their kids in sports, football, hockey, whatever. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Then I think about somebody like you growing up with 23 people in the house and being able to expand. So when I learn about like law of attraction or positive thinking or things like that, I'm like, does it honestly apply to somebody that's in that country? Or is this some sort of like Western, um, 
what well, I can't remember. There's this proper term for it, but like I'm, I'm privileged and I'm not even aware of how privileged I am. Does, does that like mindset and this philosophy apply to the really poor countries in the world? And then also what I wanted to ask, and you can kind of take my rant to go over you want with it, you'll get where I'm going with it, is we're looking at the planet now and we have a time. What's always bugged me is famine. And uh, start, why the hell are people starving right now? It pisses me off. Then we look at, uh, you know, war, things like that. Um, and then we have these spiritual practices of trying to connect to like God or mm-hmm. spirit in some way and create a mm-hmm. life. You wanted to do this to, to improve your life and the family, right? You're, you guys could use some abundance. So mm-hmm. do you have any like suggestions for, for just at, on a planetary scale of how we would tackle those problems or for somebody in that situation to use these same principles to get out from like the depths of poverty where you can't even, mm-hmm. you know, go get a pencil. So th- th- it's a two part question. So it's a two part answer, right? So the first part was does law of attraction, positive thinking and all the other personal development principles apply in the other countries? A hundred percent. Yes. It absolutely applies in all countries that you can know. Here's what happens though. What is the definition of abundance for you living in Canada in say Vancouver or whatever the country is, sorry, the city is, versus somebody who lives in Jaipur, the definition of abundance is very different, right? Definition of abundance for me when I was in India, when I was growing up, all I wanted to make was $1,000 a month. And that would have been a lot of money for me. Today, even a lot of people who make $2,000 a month is a lot of money for India, right? $2,000 a month is probably like base here in Canada, right? Everybody, Canada and US, like it's the basic that you get. It's like you get it when you are 19, 20, 25, whatever the age is, right? That is a lot of money for a 40-year-old in India, right? So abundance is relative. You have to see it in context of place that you live in and the reality you want to create, right? So law of attraction, can you generate millions and millions of dollars or millions and millions of rupees? Yes. Of course, law of attraction, not in the secret way, in the way that it actually is, which is you actually have to do something about it, not just think and dream about it, right? But does it work? Absolutely. Positive thinking, does it work? Absolutely. Is it harder to do it in the reality for that matter, where there's everything is non-abundant around you? Yes. Because you feel like it's, what am I positive thinking about here, <laughs> right? Everything is a shit show, right? <laughs> so that's a, that, it's, it's a harder to do, but does it work if you're able to do it? Yes. Does it make you more resilient than most of the other people in the world? Yes. So does it work? The answer is yes. It just changes how the outcome looks like because that's as far as your thinking would go as well in that reality. Because as much as we shouldn't be influenced by the external factors, we have no control in being able to be influenced by external factors, right? We can fend it off. We can try to protect ourselves, but we are human beings. We are going to take on the shit, right? So there's no way to say, I will completely ignore what's in my reality around me. I can change my reality. I'm aware of that. And in time, I can create such a great reality that I really am protected by it, but that can't be today, right? It needs to be the process that it needs to be, right? I can start with the intention of saying, changing that, right? Secondly, is the dialogue around famine or war and just as planet, what the hell is happening? Uh, I, I have, and it might not be a popular view, but I have a different view on this, right? For me, yes, we are not perfect as the planet. Yes, we are not perfect as this one world. And yes, there is a, 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 one of the reasons for it could potentially be, and I'm, I'm no economist, so I, I only have a limited view on this, but one of, the, one of the reasons could be that we consume too much in one part of the world and consume too little on the other part of the world, right? Those are all truths to some degree, right? But here is what we must consider. The famine rate globally has gone down. The rate of wars or the amount of wars that actively we are pursuing in today's world has gone down dramatically. The death by natural causes have gone down. The death by hunger and misery has gone down. That's by uh, any disease has gone down. It has all gone down. Is it perfect? No. Can we do better? Yes. But does that mean that we need to be stressed about where we are? Or does, we need, does that mean that we need to continuously, creatively think about how do we keep making positive progress? I think my answer would be the latter, where I think we need to consistently just keep asking the question like you're asking and say, hey, I know there is challenge in certain parts of the world. How can I, how can I personally support that, 
right? And how can I make some positive progress towards it? How can I move the needle just a little bit, right? Because if I do that, I've done my contribution to it. And remember, this is a world that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, right? So there's a lot of things that we're carrying around and it's, it'll take a lot of years to undo it. And honestly, when you undo it, you'll find there's other problems, right? We got rid of poverty in the Western world. We got racism, right? We got, stuff will keep happening and that's fine. And I'm not saying to accept that reality. I'm saying to constantly work to change that reality, but not to be, uh, not to feel so much stress around it that we feel like, oh, what do I do about it? We don't have to be sad about it. We can be curious about it to say, hey, how do I change this? We are more abundant than we've ever been. We are less, uh, we live longer as humanity than we have ever been. So we have made great positive strides in the world. And the reason why we made those positive strides because there were enough people asking the question, how can I make this better, right? And so I say, let's do the same. Let's keep inviting ourselves to do this better, do a better life for ourselves, do a better life for other people that we meet. And we will, as a planet, constantly make progress. And I think we are going to make progress and we are making progress. We're not there yet, but we are making progress. Amazing, man. Yeah, I think that was a really great answer. Um, the one thing uh, that I think is important is that you're talking about what can I do personally and what you did in your life from your circumstances, is you took responsibility for it and you took action. You kept taking action. You kept taking action and you asked the question. I think that when you look at these big problems for me, the big thing was like kind of putting the world on my shoulders and being like, oh my goodness. Like when I just looked at how much was going on, I was like, how do I even handle all this and you can kind of get stuck and it's not an empowering space to be in when you just let it overwhelm you. So, but when you change your environment, like you did, it affects your community, your family, your brothers, your sisters, your power to influence in that little way. And so it's got to start with you because you're now empowered. You're like floating, you know, if you're at like, sea, you're yeah. not drowning. It's like, you just get yourself to float. Cool. And then if you can make like a little contraption and you can pick up one other passenger, that's great. That's a huge win, Great progress. you know, yeah. and it's asking the question. So I think it's a very grounded answer. And I really appreciate this. Um, and sometimes the person that you'll pick up is the next generation. It's not even your generation because it's hard to save sometimes when somebody's so deep into their own context and their reality, it takes a lot more time to save them, but somebody that will come into your fold and your floating mess <laughs> is, uh, is somebody who's a kid and who looks at you and goes, hey, thank you for showing me that possibility. I was stuck in this possibility that my, my immediate circle was showing me, but I see your possibility and it looks great. Let me chase that. Let me look at that. Let me learn from that. And that's a great outcome too. So sometimes, yes, it won't be your brother, your sister, your, your immediate cousin that you'll influence, but it might be their kids that you are changing or your friends that you might be helping support transcend to a different level and to be able to create positive momentum. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point too there because we're moving, like we're creating progress. And sometimes when you're in the middle of it, you don't see it. Um, but that next generation, and, and it's not progress over a day or a week or a month. We're saying like over a lifetime, we're saying five, 10, 20 years. Um, I'm reminded of this story. I saw come up on I think collective evolution once about a guy who single-handedly over like 50 or 60 years built a road by himself that connected two villages. I don't know if it was like uh, Middle East or somewhere, but it was a huge thing. He spent his whole life to build this road. And that was one thing that he could do. So he took massive responsibility, had a vision and worked towards it because it had meaning. So if we can think of these extraordinary examples and just think about all the opportunity that we have in the Western world and just apply bits of it consistently, you're going to change your director directory. Just like if you're super out of shape and you work out, you've never worked out in years, you just work out twice a week. You do that for a year, your whole trajectory on your health will change. So just don't try to go from zero to like no money. Don't know where your vision is. Don't have any idea to it's all sorted out and you're driving a Ferrari. Just like take that first step and keep taking steps and move in that direction that you create for yourself. Absolutely. Well, man, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. I know you got to run. So I just want to put it back to you. You can feel free to elaborate as much as you wish. But thank you so much for your work, for writing the books, for continuing uh, to contribute and to be the example, right? That's 
you know, that's the best thing that you can do is be the best example of yourself. And then people can look at that and be like, you know what? I like, I like that. I, I learned from that. So I appreciate what you're doing. Um, anything that you want to touch on, uh, go deeper into or, or leave the listeners with. So I want to invite everybody who's listening to this to, to check out the book. It's called Live Big. It's available at livebigthebook.com. And what we are doing with the book is we are trying to change the dialogue for you to, to not approach life from a context of how do I make more money only. You will make more money as a counter effect of what we do in the book for you and with you is we show you some of the strategies and real perspective shifts that you can invite in your life right now to be able to look at your life in a very, very different way where you can actually have all of it. You can have the relationships, you can have the health, you can have the body that you want, you can have the experiences that you want, and you can grow your business. So it brings it all together and really brings a deep research around how to approach time, how to approach uh, people, how to approach culture, how to approach a product, how to approach your passion, so you can bring it all together and see, okay, this is how I create a cohesive life. The intent for me to write the book is to not have something that gives one more strategy to you, right? We all have a lot of strategies and they're available widely. What I really believe is entrepreneurs need more of a perspective shift. If they can look at the same things in a different way, in a way that is more progressive, in a way that is actually the right way of looking at it through, through research, you will be able to change your reality. And my intention is to be able to empower entrepreneurs who are the greatest change makers, who are the people who create great positive progress. I, my, my intention is to be able to influence us to be able to look at our lives slightly differently so we can acknowledge that we are, yes, changing the world, but we also get to enjoy this life that we have and we also get to create a new reality around it. Awesome, man. I love that. Well, I'm excited to check out the book. Um, so what last piece of advice, if you could give one pe a person a piece of advice on just happiness or life, what would you, what would you share with them? So I, I love to end all of my conversations around one thing, because I think that's one thing that we need to hear again and again. And that's called, you have a choice. And the reason why I say that is because often we believe that we don't have a choice and that wherever we are in our reality is the truth of it all. That we feel that if we lose it, we'll lose it all. Like I felt that many times in my life where I couldn't let go of certain things because I believed that's just the ultimate it. And that is because that's how we see the world, right? We are in a reality, we're just trapped in it. And we think that's the ultimate truth, but it's not. You have a choice. And I want to invite you as an entrepreneur, as a professional, as a truth seeker to, to go out and have and create that choice for you. It'll be hard. It's not going to come easy. It's going to need the work. But at the same point of time, it is possible. So go ahead and make efforts towards the choices that you want to make so you can live a big life. Awesome, man. I love all that. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your work and uh, just have an amazing uh, day. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Nope. Oh, and.